What is it that causes that feeling in our chests? The uncomfortable sensation that weighs our chests down and make us feel like we can't take those full, deep breaths. Three point eight percent of our population have experienced generalized anxiety disorders or GADs and three point four percent have experienced depression. In the past week alone, one in six people will have experienced a common mental health problem. So we've all experienced some form of anxiety in our lives, whether it was before a big decision, a wedding, something money related. It's something we're not unfamiliar with, and yet it's one of the most complex disorders that we're aware of. I've been living with anxiety for almost as long as I can remember. But it wasn't until five years ago that I became aware of it. Before I knew what these feelings were, I bottled them up and ignored the possibility of having them. Complacency, coupled with ignorance, was a huge factor in how I felt. A lot of these anxieties came from my feelings of self-worth or lack thereof. I always had the urge to do more with my life, but always felt like I wasn't capable. My first experience in a therapy setting was actually in a group. I was surrounded by people who suffered from deep depression, deeper anxiety than I thought I had. These people had experienced things like severe loss, suicidal thoughts. That led me to believe that I didn't belong there. To me, I thought my anxiety was this big compared to everybody else's. It was a feeling of guilt, a guilt that I didn't feel like I fit in with all these people. These people who clearly needed more attention than I did. Dr. Tina Mystery, a clinical psychologist based in Birmingham, England, likens this feeling to a guilt that we attach to the pain we've experienced. Is it a normal part of going through anxiety? What would you, kind of in your experience, what would you say? So guilt forms part of anxiety because if you, as you described it, you were saying that, you know, you feel anxiety mm. okay, within whatever certain situation that occurs. Yeah. So the guilt is like that. I, I kind of describe it as this trifle. <clears throat> so you imagine at the base, you've got your jelly and sponge yep. and that's the anxiety yep. and then on top of that you've got that lovely kind of my favorite part the whipped creamy <laughs> stuff yeah. right that you know and that's what we're adding to it and then on top of that you might feel you know angry at yourself for feeling guilty for feeling anxiety yep so all this additional chaos and additional drama yeah. that you are applying is actually all this like sort of internal messages or internal dialogue that mm. have, have been kind of you've been taught or you've been you've picked up mm. that makes yes, sense yes it's very normal and yes what this does is it, it perpetuates the cycle of anxiety I'd kept a journal since 2012, but I hadn't intended on it turning into a therapeutic outlet in which I could reflect. Initially, it was an outlet for me to note down ideas and thoughts for films or videos I wanted to make. As I continued to fill these little books up, I started to pick up subtle cues about my moods, how I would react to certain situations, but I still didn't have enough information. Although I was attending group therapy sessions, I wasn't getting out of them what was intended. Instead, my feelings of guilt and feeling like I didn't belong there outweighed my need to address my anxiety. It was as though I didn't feel as though I was worthy enough to be there. Anyone I spoke to about the anxiety and the group sessions didn't quite understand why I was attending the sessions. The consensus was because I seemed happy, it was a strange concept for me to even consider anything to do with counselling. I spoke with cognitive behavioural psychotherapist Hina Pancholi about this interesting concept of high functioning anxiety. Um, I think there must, I think there's probably loads of reasons why people might cover up or look as if they're covering up anxiety. I think probably one of the biggest things that comes to mind is to avoid other people noticing how they're feeling. Um, so, for example, I don't know, in the workplace, um, you know not having others notice that they may be struggling or um, not dealing with things. I think um, a really common sort of safety or coping behaviour um, can be things like using humour, happiness. Um, sort of in a CBT point of view, what we would sort of call this is sort of overcompensating behaviours. Right. Yeah. So um, overcompensating in areas to mask their anxiety. So, for example... Um, you know, coming across quite full of energy, loud, talkative, 
um, filling in silences in conversation, all of those sorts of things. Um, you know, people with high functioning anxiety may mm. may use some of these things to to get through day to day situations. Mm. After these group therapy sessions, I needed something more substantial. I'd started a new job, and I experienced what could be considered as my first anxiety attack. So my first anxiety attack um, was an interesting one. I remember, I remember like it happened yesterday. Um, I remember it specifically because it's, it's an experience that you tend not to forget, and it's an interesting one. So I was walking to work at the time, and I was fine, generally. I mean, I had the underlying sense of anxiety, as I always do, walking to work. And I was listening to music. And all of a sudden, two minutes from work, I started to feel my heart just beating really hard. And I could just, I could feel it. I could actually feel it. And I've never really felt my heart beat like that before. It was the first time I'd experienced anything like that. I remember standing in that work bathroom, literally asking myself, why am I crying? I had no idea why it was happening. So, you know, it's difficult to have one exact pinpoint cause sure. for, for panic attacks. I suppose when we're thinking of anxiety and panic, it's a reaction to threat. So it's a natural, mm. um, innate reaction to, to any threat. But nowadays, mm. what, what tends to happen is, because we're not faced with those sorts of real dangers, you know, an, wild animals running running after us, wanting to eat us. Yeah, Our situations yeah. are completely different. So yeah. the body has still this biological mechanism, the fight or flight response, um, you know, um, yeah. a lot of people call it that. And even a sense of perceived threat or a thought can be enough to set mm. that whole system off. So, and, in you know, in some cases, some people may not experience panic attacks every single right. time they feel anxious. Yeah. Um, but but other times it may spiral into a panic attack mm. if, if the you know if we're not doing anything about it. Straight after this, I remember speaking to my manager who told me about the counselling service and how it worked. What I found after a cathartic five sessions was that I was able to finally articulate myself emotionally in a way that I wasn't able to before. There was a lot to think about. I knew that if I wanted to change the way I reacted to my anxiety, I needed to adjust my thinking. I needed to be open to the idea of it being changed. So what would you say are ways that we could look to give our minds downtime and, and some peace in the, the excess of noise that crowded mm. every day? Yeah. I mean, there's no direct set answer. No. I think, yeah, like no, you said, it's different for everyone. Yeah. I think the key sort of things to keep in mind is um, trying to create balance. So, mm. Um, you know, looking at your work-life balance or just mm. looking at your life balance um, mm. generally, you know, is are there areas of your life that you feel you might be neglecting? So, yeah. you know, things that you are, you know, that you might enjoy or mm. things that give you a sense of achievement. Mm. Um, what we tend to see with um, anxiety and stress is that because of those other symptoms of anxiety, so things like tiredness, exhaustion, mm. we tend to do less. And then yeah. by doing less, that makes us feel worse. You know, we may not get that sense of um, achieving anything. So mm. that can then, you know, spiral into things like low mood, We aren't as fragile as we think we are. As humans, we've shown ourselves to be resilient, patient, and resourceful, and we don't give ourselves enough credit for that. We have the capacity to do incredible things through an insurmountable level of adversity. In order for us to survive, mm. we need anxiety. Mm. Without anxiety, we wouldn't um, we wouldn't understand what a threat will be. Yeah. We wouldn't understand how to get through something that could potentially kill us. Yeah. Yeah. If you start to think about and unpack what that means, mm. anxiety is almost a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. So actually it's not a dysfunctional part of our brain or kind of our body mm. acting up. It's actually a very primitive instinct that is really important for us to, to preserve. We need it. Getting rid of anxiety or mental health issues shouldn't be the goal. Changing our relationship with it and understanding that it's a part of us should be the focus. Being around people we love, things we enjoy doing, making ourselves happy. This is the point of life. 
Life isn't short. It's the longest thing you'll ever experience. What does your life look like a year from now? What do you picture yourself doing? Where are you? I couldn't picture myself being happy for the longest time. Uh, so far so good. You, you having fun? It's still a struggle, but the outlook is looking good. I hope so. Is it on? It is on. Mic is on.